right, sorry for the delays. Um, I want to start out today by doing a little exercise. Uh, the exercise is lifted from a book called Nonviolent Communication, and it's called uh, Translating Have To to Choose To. The idea is that we all have things in our lives which we do not because we inherently enjoy them, but just out of some kind of sense of obligation. We feel that we have to do them. And the idea of the exercise is, is to acknowledge that there's a choice there, and once we realize that it's a choice, figure out what we're gonna do about it, uh, and think about maybe how to remake that decision. So you take all these things in your life that you don't really enjoy doing, you make a big list of them, and then you have to fill in one by one this sentence with each thing. So you say, I choose to X because I want Y. You figure out what's the reason that you make the choice to, uh, to do that thing. And what you'll basically find is one of uh, a few things will happen. Maybe the thing that you want is actually really important and you'll find new meaning in the thing that you were doing. And it'll feel more like an active choice that you want to make. Maybe you'll say, well, the thing that I want wasn't really that important, so I don't really have to do it. Or you'll say, well, the thing that I want is important, but maybe this isn't quite the right way to get to, get to that point. Or uh, maybe there's uh, just a, a, a different kind of broader set of strategies that I need to really get the thing that I want in some kind of better way. So today we're gonna ask the question, why do we choose to write good code? And that's a little bit of a scary question, right? You know, what do you mean? We, we, we have to write good code, right? It's, you know, we're, it's ingrained into us. You know, we go to talks at conferences. We read books. We watch podcasts, or li listen to podcasts, I guess. We watch, uh, we watch stuff online. We read blog posts all about good code. We have to do it. That's just, you know, that's what we do, right? So I'm here to tell you, first of all, today, you don't have to write good code. You choose to write good code, hopefully. Um, and part of today will be figuring out why we choose to write good code. That second line, because I want what? What do we fill that in with? Um, maybe we fill it in with, well, if I don't write good code by some kind of uh, arbitrary standard, then I'll get fired. Uh, a, a, a sad reason to, but, um, but that might be it. Um, but ideally, we'd find something meaningful and important in terms of why we're choosing to write good code. So why do we care about writing good code? And because this is a talk about software quality, um, and that's really the ultimate goal here, we have to ask, is good code actually the same as quality software? So we'll get back to that. But first I want to talk about something uh, somewhat but not entirely different. Dave Thomas, Bob Martin, uh, others as well, but I, I mention them just because they were signatories on the original Agile Manifesto, have said that Agile is broken. It didn't accomplish the revolution that it was supposed to accomplish. Here's a, a quote from Bob Martin quoting Kent Beck, who was also there. He said that one of the goals of the Agile Manifesto was to heal the divide between development and business. There was a, a gap that had, that had been created, a chasm between the two sides, uh, and a lot of tension, and the goal was to relieve some of that tension uh, and, and find ways to work uh, synergetically and harmoniously. Reality check, I don't think it really worked. Uh, they don't think it did either, so uh, at least I have uh, some people who were involved in Agile right from the top saying, uh, not great situation. But what it became was basically uh, some kind of business person, project manager, or whatever it is, would, uh, would take a course, get certified in something, and uh, basically tell developers, okay, now you're all gonna do agile because uh, that will uh, lead to better software. It's something that developers do to, to keep business people happy, if you could even do, in quotes, agile. Um, usually the form that this takes is Scrum. Uh, so I, I forget the number, 60, 80%, something like that, of organizations that claim to be doing Agile are using Scrum as their implementation. Uh, fun fact, uh, as far as I can tell, because I've read through the, uh, the Scrum Guide and I've read through the Agile Manifesto and compared the two, it addresses maybe 50% of what Agile is and it kind of misses out on all the values. So I'm not saying that Scrum is bad. I, I don't want to give that impression. Um, I think Scrum has a lot of really good ideas it's just not an implementation of Agile, it's a framework in which you can choose to be Agile or not, it makes it easier in some ways, but it's not actually agility. 
we don't need more processes. Sometimes processes can be helpful, but they're a tool towards something more important. And what I think that we need, and this is why I'm coming, kinda, coming down kind of hard on Scrum, is we need more trust. Scrum focuses a lot on transparency. Uh, as far as I understand, transparency is basically we have two sides. Each side says to the other, I need to know what you're doing at all times. I need you to be transparent about it so that when I see something going wrong, I can jump in and, and complain uh, and micromanage you. Trust, on the other hand, uh, is let's, let's have a conversation. Let's understand that there are two sides to the situation here. And let's talk about the needs of each side. Each side will express their needs in a way that makes sense to the other side. And once we're confident that the other side has heard our needs and understands them, we can rely on the other side to think about our needs uh, and account for them in their own decisions. That's what trust is, to me, at least. And that's what allows us to build effective organizations. I think we can solve this problem. I don't think it's, it's even too complex. It's difficult, but I don't think it's complex. And it starts with communication. If we learn to communicate between developers and business people in a way that, that makes sense to both sides, then we can start building the trust that we need to have highly effective organizations. So we have an ambitious goal today. We're gonna create a common language for developers and business people to be able to express their needs in a way that makes sense to both sides. And the way that we're going to achieve it is by going right for the jugular, taking, taking the thing that causes a lot of uh, uh, tension between the two sides, and trying to, to understand it again. Figuring out why we write good code. A lot of times we, we, we push for good code uh, in whatever way we define it, uh, and, and good code takes time and takes investment, uh, and it's, it's hard to explain that to the other side, and that causes a lot of tension. So we're gonna figure out why we write good code. But first, let's figure out why do we write code. And I really mean that. Why do we write code ever? Seems like a strange question, right? You know, we're, we're developers, that's what we do, that's our job, right? Um, well, newsflash, controversial statement, okay? But I think, it's, I think it's, it, it's certainly pretty clear to me, your job is not to write code. Your job is to solve problems. Uh, I wanna give an anecdote from specifically in another field that will help us look at things a little bit more objectively. So there's a, a, a man once came to a plastic surgeon and he said, I need you to do some surgery for me. Uh, my ears are very large and I want you to make my ears smaller. Interesting. So the surgeon decided to probe further. Okay, why do you want this surgery? What problem are you trying to solve? And this guy said, well, uh, it's, it's not a problem for me actually at this stage of my life at all. Um, you know, I get along fine, we're all adults, right? But when I was a kid, I got teased a lot, I got bullied a lot uh, over the size of my ears and I don't wanna pass on that problem to my kids. I'm about to start a family and I don't want them to get my ears. So how about you fix my ears so that I won't pass it on? So he clearly still had a Lamarckian understanding of evolution. Um, I was curious how many laughs that would get. <laughs> so, um, uh, and basically what the doctor did was say, hey, let's talk about modern genetics. Let's understand how these things actually work uh, and why I can't solve your problem. And the solution that you suggested certainly doesn't help. If the doctor had said, okay, that's nice. Let's, let's schedule uh, a surgery. We would call that malpractice. But it's funny, because that's very clear to all of us, I think. But what happens when someone approaches a developer and says, hey, I want you to build a mobile app for me? And the developer says, okay, without even understanding the problem that we're trying to solve, without understanding whether this is the right solution, maybe they need a marketing director, maybe they need to just have an email campaign, maybe a lot of things. There's thousands of apps out there in the app store that reflect this problem. They, they don't do anything for anybody, they don't, they don't matter. I, I have a hard time calling them high quality apps because they don't solve a problem. If you're not solving a problem, there's never a reason to write the code. Now, this doesn't sound very businessy, so I'm gonna give a little translation. Your job is to create value. And that's kind of a loaded term. It means a lot of things to different people. So I'm just gonna give a working definition that we're gonna use for the rest of the talk. Value creation, in the context of this talk, means one of three things, or, or more of those three things. Generating revenue, lowering costs, or reducing risk. Those are the main things that matter in business. 
Um, in the specific case of a nonprofit, instead of generating revenue, you can substitute doing whatever good the nonprofit is supposed to do. Um, and, uh, but, but you know, on the whole, the same, the same pattern still applies. Those are the, the, the three things that we mainly care about. Uh, and where do users come in? Well, generally, the way that you do these three things is by meeting the needs of your users. So we're gonna use uh, meeting business needs and meeting user needs kind of interchangeably in the talk. Hopefully they go together. When they don't is a whole discussion that I'm just not getting into today. So to recap, why write code to create value? That's it. That's the only reason we should ever be writing code. If that's the case, why do we care about writing good code? I think the answer is simple. It usually helps to create value. Does that mean that good code is the same as quality software? According to this definition, I don't think so. Uh, so here's the, the second of two controversial statements. I would define software quality as just the amount of value that it creates. We're writing the code to create value. If it creates that value, it's fit for purpose. It is ergo high quality. Um, if it doesn't meet the needs, then uh, it can be you know, really well written under the hood, but it doesn't really help because it's not actually solving a problem. So rather than asking how can we write better code, what we should really be asking is how do we target our efforts in coding to maximize value creation? And how does, does good code fit within that whole broad picture? So uh, I'm gonna, gonna commit a, a, a major programming sin now, uh, which is uh, solving a problem by writing a framework. It's not JavaScript, it's just, just, a, just a human people framework. Uh, it's only three words, so uh, hopefully it's uh, you know, not, not too bad. Um, I think that th there are three factors that if we, if we think about uh, these three, we can pretty much fit anything about software quality as we've defined it into one of these three factors or, or two or three out of them. I call them usefulness, sustainability, and accuracy. We're gonna talk about what each of these means, but you'll notice that there's an acronym there. I didn't, I didn't choose these words over the acronym. Like that, that, that happens sometimes, you just want a cool acronym. Um, I, they, it happened to be the acronym that came out, but if thinking about the USA helps you in terms of uh, remembering the three words, all the better. All right, so let's start with usefulness. Each of these is going to have a question and a target. The question in terms of usefulness is does it solve a problem effectively? Pretty straightforward, uh, but a lot, of, a lot of details there. The target here is our users. Again, using users and, and business needs a little bit interchangeably. The question is, uh, is it a problem that affects users first of all? Sometimes we spend a lot of money to code up a solution that doesn't actually address a need. Uh, we have to make sure in whatever way we can that we, we verify that the problem actually exists and that it affects the users that we're gonna be uh, addressing. Then, even if we've correctly identified a problem, it's important to, to think about, well, is this actually a solution to the problem? Uh, or are we missing something? And it can't just solve a problem, it has to solve the problem in a way that works for the users. Because if it works but doesn't work for them, you haven't really done an awful lot. Uh, I wanna uh, cite a story from uh, Tara Scherner de la Fuente, who gave uh, a keynote at RubyConf last year, uh, which I think uh, absolutely illustrates this point really nicely. She was working with a user of one of their applications, um, just kind of seeing what they were experiencing. And uh, it was to upload a spreadsheet with uh, a whole bunch of rows and anything that the application could figure out, great. If not, uh, then you had to kind of fill it in. So some of the, uh, one of the columns or was, uh, was a column of dates and you know, most, of the, most of us think like, okay, date, date picker, great. Uh, in the case of this application, they decided to allow inser inserting dates, inputting dates by uh, a drop-down menu without sorting the dates. So there were just hundreds of dates in a completely unsorted list that they had to uh, look through, somehow manage to find the right date, and then repeat it again and again and again and again and again until the whole spreadsheet was done. And if there was an error, by the way, you had to go back to the beginning and it wouldn't save what you had done so far. Uh, that meets the needs technically, you'll eventually get it done, I guess, but it's not in a way that works for the user. It's really hard to call that a high quality product. Okay, that's usefulness. Sustainability, what's it about? The question is, 
can we keep building without unnecessary obstacles? Uh, and I thought about this a lot. Uh, I didn't want to say without obstacles because there are always going to be obstacles there. The question is are we identifying the most important obstacles and trying to account for them, trying to limit the things that are going to stand in our way as we continue developing. The targets, in this case there's two targets which I think are really one. The first is our software. Is the software resistant to change? That breaks down into two sub-questions. One is an issue of understanding. Is the software written in a way that we just won't understand what it does and it's going to be hard to make changes? The other piece of it is, well, even if it's very clearly written, we understand what it does, but the archite some certain architecture choices we might have made make it hard to change things later on. So it just takes longer, it's a lot more effort to do. The other target is a development team. We so often forget that the development team is I don't even want to say it's as much a part of our software as the code itself. It's more of a part of our software than the code itself. Think about how, how just carefree you are when like deleting code, putting in new stuff. Uh, you don't do that with your team, right? The, the, the rate of churn is ideally a lot, uh, a lot lower. And uh, you, know, you crash a development team, you basically don't have a product anymore. So it's important to be aware whether the team is unstable in some kind of way that, you know, if things are, are tipped a little bit, is that going to prevent future progress? Is the team going to collapse? Or just become less effective in some way? That's sustainability. Let's talk about accuracy. This is the one that uh, we probably think about the most. The question that we're asking is pretty simple. Does the software work the way that we think it does? The target here, you think I'm going to say the code, right? The target is ourselves. We have to ask four questions. Have we developed our understanding of the problem? Sometimes we just don't understand the problem correctly. Every, we do everything right in the coding step, but we haven't taken the time or the effort to figure out first, is this actually the problem? Is it, does, it, does it solve the problem? Is it, you know, all, all the usefulness stuff leads into an accuracy problem. Have we developed understanding of the code? Is there something about the code that makes it hard for us to, to get the next step done uh, and, and we're just coding the wrong thing? Uh, sometimes there, there could be issues of cognitive overload, that even if the code is relatively clear, but there's so much going on, too many integrated systems, microservices, whatever, um, that, that uh, you, just, you just don't understand the full impact of your actions. And finally, our understanding of a problem changes over time. Sometimes the problem itself changes over time. If we're not updating the code to reflect that, that ultimately appears as an accuracy problem. These seem like things that are maybe a little bit like mashed together that shouldn't be together. But if you think about it from the perspective of the user, if any of these are failing, your software is broken. That's a bug report, any of those questions. So to me, that means that they're all issues of accuracy. I can't speak for anybody else, but when I think about why I write good code, why I choose, actively choose to write good code, it's because I want software that's useful, sustainable, and accurate, and good code is a significant tool in helping you get there. Here's the traditional model with the uh, business development chasm pictured. Uh, in the right corner of the room, we have uh, accuracy and sustainability. Those are seen as the domain of the developers to write you know, good, accurate code. And on the left side, we have usefulness, which is the domain of designers, UX people, product people, et cetera. Um, and never the twain shall meet. We really subdivide those responsibilities, and it's not surprising that each side advocates for, for, for the things that it cares about. Well, we said never the twain shall meet, but today the twain shall meet. What we actually need is to think about quality as all of those factors together. We need to have, we, we, we can't leave out any element of that. And we have to be part of that usefulness circle as well. So this has all been pretty abstract, I realize. And uh, I don't want to leave you with just kind of abstract floating in the air ideas. I want to take this down to a very practical level. So what we're going to do, clear out the diagram. We're going to ask the question, is it quality software? And we're actually going to fill in the things that we do on a, on a much more granular level to address each of these three points, usefulness, Accuracy, sorry, sustainability, and accuracy. 
Uh, now this is a Venn diagram. There is gonna be some overlap on occasion. Practices might contribute to more than one of these circles um, or to something that we might think of as maybe the confluence between those two circles. So I'll just give a little more definition uh, in the middle. We have uh, between accuracy and usefulness, the question of does it work as the, in the way that the users expect? Right, less thinking about ourselves, starting to think more in the direction of our users. Between accuracy and sustainability, we're asking the question, can we keep building our system without breaking our system? It's, it's future-focused accuracy. And up top, between sustainability and usefulness, we have the question of, are there obstacles to future usefulness? Essentially, things that aren't threatening usefulness right now, but we, we're, we're aware that the choices that we make now might have some kind of impact in the future on how useful our product is. All right, so uh, I titled this talk, What Comes After Solid? I thought it was a, uh, you know, a nice, uh, juicy title. Um, but I also think it kind of makes sense to start by talking about solid because it's just this traditional metric of, of software quality and uh, you know, we, we, we think a lot about it, we talk a lot about it. Um, I'm actually not gonna talk a lot about it. Uh, I'm actually gonna run through it really, really fast. So if you aren't familiar with all of the, the details of solid, that's okay. Um, I could spend the whole, the whole 40 minutes just talking about that. Um, so you might be bored for about a minute, but we'll be fine after that. There's tons of stuff that you will understand. Fine, so solid stands for five different principles that are related to creating whatever we might define as, uh, as well-crafted software. The single responsibility principle, the idea that every element in your system should do one thing and do it well. The open-close principle, uh, which is short for open for extension, close for modification, uh, meaning that you should be able to add new features without modifying existing code. Uh, how you do that is, again, a long story. So not gonna get into it. Uh, Liskov substitution principle, basically use inheritance properly. Uh, don't inherit from a superclass because you need like a method. Inherit because it's actually a specialized instance, but it should fully implement uh, the superclass and all of its functionality. Interface segregation. Uh, this is not that relevant for Ruby because we don't really have interfaces in the, in the traditional sense. Um, but I think of it as, you know, ultimately it's about uh, limiting the surface area of how objects depend on other objects. Uh, you can do that without explicit interfaces. Uh, technically, I don't think it, it matches a principle, but it's close enough. Uh, and finally, dependency inversion. Uh, depends on abstractions, not concretions. You're basically pushing dependencies to the outside of your system. And then the core elements, the units, are depending on uh, sort of a theoretical idea of what the, um, the, the dependency is doing without relating to too many of the implementation details. So let's uh, run through, we'll do this very quickly. Um, SRP, I think, is a big winner. Uh, if every item in your system does one thing and does it well, it's easy to tell if it's, if it's doing the thing that it's supposed to do. It's much easier to change later because you know exactly what to go back to and modify. Uh, and this is sort of a personal opinion. There's gonna be a lot of personal opinions here, so I apologize, but kind of sorry, not sorry. Um, <laughs> the main thing here is, is not to, to learn the details. It's to see the way of thinking, uh, and ultimately you're gonna apply it yourselves. Uh, but back to right here. So usefulness, um, I think the single responsibility means that each part of your system has a very clear responsibility, and that lets you start thinking about, is this uh, the right responsibility is it uh, something that actually creates value for people? Is this, or, is this something that shouldn't, sh should or should not exist in our system? Uh, it opens up a pathway to those conversations. So I think of it as a very, very central practice. Open-closed is really just about the future, so I put it all the way over in sustainability. Liskov substitution uh, is about avoiding certain classes uh, of errors, so I think about that as avoiding errors now and avoiding errors later, accuracy, sustainability. Uh, interface segregation and dependency inversion again, are really about the future. So those go all the way in the sustainability camp. Uh, so that's where solid falls out in the way that we've uh, expressed it. Uh, it's all in the sustainability camp. There are a few that, that get into other places, and again, SRP to me is a pretty central practice. Let's, uh, let's talk about some other stuff. Um, Sandy Metz has her four principles, which get the acronym TRUE. Uh, you can read about them in, in the first chapter of Pooter. Uh, four principles that are meant to create systems that are, uh, that, that are uh, much, more, um, much more robust in terms of their ability to accept change. Makes it much easier to change them in the future. Uh, transparent, meaning that the consequences of changing code should be obvious. 
reasonable. The cost of change should be proportional to, to the benefits. If it's a small change, then uh, it shouldn't be, that, 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 or sorry, if it's a non, not, not that beneficial change, um, you know, versus if it's, a, if it's a very, very beneficial change, uh, the cost of change should be proportionally related. Um, usable, basically, is the code reusable in other contexts. And exemplary, your code should set a good example for coders to come, because of course, we all kind of look at the system, see that, oh, it is the way it is, therefore, like, let's just perpetuate those qualities in the future, because obviously, whoever was here before uh, did it right. Those uh, are all explicitly about the future, so I put them right into that sustainability camp as well. So we're pretty heavy on sustainability, um, but let's try to diversify our strategy for quality just a little bit. Uh, let's talk about testing. The first thing that very often in our community we forget uh, is, is even a choice is testing at all. You could not test. There's uh, a lot, a lot of places that, uh, and, and teams that don't test at all. So choosing to test at all is a practice. Um, code coverage, the, uh, the attempt to make sure that every piece of your system uh, is exercised in, in a test. Different types of tests uh, that we could talk about. There's unit tests, which test a small piece of your system. Integration tests, which are uh, testing how pieces of your system interact with each other, a much broader perspective. Uh, and manual QA, which is even further out, uh, you have a person who probably hasn't worked on your system uh, themselves, thinking uh, about a user perspective, trying to use it as a user, trying to break it, et cetera. Okay, then we have TDD and BDD. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, offer my own definition of it. I'm just gonna try to give my understanding of uh, how the RSpec book defines them. Either way, you write your tests first, but with TDD, you start out with very small units. You build, you build your way up out, to the, out towards the edges of your system. With BDD, it's the opposite. You start out uh, with, the, with the broader perspective of what you're trying to do for your whole system and then work your way down. So how do those fall out? Well, not surprisingly, they're all in the accuracy camp because they all help you write more accurate code. Um, coverage helps you out with the future as well. It's explicitly designed that if anything about your code changes in a way that's, uh, that's gonna break it, you have a test alerting you to that fact. Uh, you have BDD, manual Q QA, and integration tests, I think actually do relate a little bit to usefulness because they're making you think about your system not in terms of is the code right, but uh, what is the purpose of writing this code? Uh, and testing I put in the middle because I think that all of these actually provide a pretty strong signal uh, in a bunch of different directions. Uh, so I think of testing as essential practice as well. All right, uh, so that was a little dry. Let's talk about some hot new buzzwords. Uh, everyone's talking about functional programming. Uh, DHH seems to be, I'm not sure if he's in Twitter or not, <laughs> based on the, the keynote this morning. Um, but everyone's talking about it. Type systems, yeah, everyone's talking now about gradual typing, soft typing, TypeScript, type, type, type. Immutability, uh, creating objects that should not change after they're created. Uh, and scalability, everyone's talk, is talking about now how you have to be Facebook scale, you have to be Twitter scale, you have to be, I don't even know. <laughs> um, so most of these are actually really in the accuracy camp. You could make an argument to push over some of them into sustainability just a little bit, um, but ultimately they're about writing code that's accurate, that doesn't, that doesn't have unexpected side effects. Um, so, uh, so that's most of them, scalability, is, uh, is a little different, it's about future usefulness. And the reason that I say that is because if you actually need scalability right now, that, that's not called scalability anymore. That's called our app is down in production. <laughs> that, that's a different problem. An important one, but not the same. Scalability is about, well, one day we might need to you know, deal with a lot, lot more load, so let's think about that now. Uh, which, I don't know how useful that is, but uh, for, for some apps, I guess it can be. All right, complexity metrics, those are fun. Cyclomatic complexity, how many uh, assignments, branching, and conditionals does your code have that make it uh, more difficult to understand? Uh, if you use Flay, uh, it's, it's looking at that. Low conescence, this was introduced to me by the patron saint of wonder, Jim Wyrick, uh, in a talk that he gave uh, a few years back. Um, basically, different places of your code that have to change in tandem uh, are, are create conescence, and we wanna lower that. We wanna minimize how, much, how many things you have to, you have to change together uh, to, to have your system not break. So I put that, uh, basically the more complex something is, the harder it is to, to write correctly the first time and the harder it is to write correctly the next time also. So that's, that's where I, I see those falling out. Okay, now we get to something that's uh, for me a lot of fun, something I care about a lot, which is team-oriented practices. 
organization conventions. Uh, if you have something like, you know, we all use the same, uh, we all use Rails, we all, uh, you know, use a certain, a certain tech stack, a certain process tool, uh, anything that, that is consistent across your organization that makes it easy to, um, to move across teams if need be, uh, that's, that's one team-oriented practice. A style guide, uh, and ideally enforcement of that style guide pro programmatically with uh, Rubocop, JSLint, whatever is the appropriate tool. Something that keeps your code consistent uh, so it's much easier to navigate and understand. The bus factor. Uh, this is the measurement of how many people on your team would have to be hit by a bus uh, in order to destroy your application. Uh, fun fact, most teams have a bus factor of one. Um, which is bad because uh, occasionally, aside from dying, uh, people also quit, get fired, um, take vacations, get sick. We want to ideally have, have room in our organizations for people to do normal people things uh, and have our apps not be destroyed. So mainly knowledge sharing, uh, also upping the level of really everybody on, on the team rather than uh, kind of hoarding knowledge or, or skill. Code review, okay? Uh, Stuff gets reviewed before it's checked into source control. Uh, pair programming or, or mob programming, um, the, the sort of like code review uh, on steroids, um, taking, uh, taking multiple developers, however many it is, uh, and having them work on code at the same time, each providing their own perspectives. Uh, internal documentation, readmes, stuff like that, things that help you uh, both onboard new developers and also remind you of, uh, of things that you might have forgotten uh, or you might have forgotten to share with other people on your team. Debugging tools, stuff uh, that helps you out a lot when things break uh, and you need more insight into your system. And the last thing is mentorship, uh, the, which I'm choosing to define, and it's a choice, I'll admit it, but I'm choosing to define as taking uh, two people on your team who have different skill sets, pairing them together in a, in a formal context over a long period of time, uh, and having them share their skills with each other. So most of these fall into, into sustainability because they're practices that help you build up your team. Uh, your team works better together, your team is more stable. Uh, I put mentorship on that crossover with accuracy because uh, it turns out that people who uh, are more skilled end up writing better code. Uh, so both the first time as well as, uh, keeping, again, keeping your team healthy in the future. Uh, code review, I put uh, in the crossover between accuracy and usefulness because uh, code review, first of all, is just a good check on whether your code is doing what it's supposed to do, but it also creates an opportunity for a conversation about should we be writing this code? Is this the right code to write right now? Is this the right solution to the problem that we're facing? Um, and pairing and mobbing, like I said, are kind of code review on steroids. The cool thing about it is that it does all those things while also building up your team, building those relationships. Uh, I once saw uh, something, uh, a, a Quora answer by Kent Beck uh, where, where he was asked, you know, so, so actually someone just asked the world, you know, does Kent Beck believe that pair programming, pro, pair programming is always a good idea? Um, so Kent Beck, I guess, found that and answered. Um, he basically said uh, when either the, the problem space is big, the solution space is big, or you need to build relationships on a team. It's really important to remember that pair programming or mob programming also have that effect. All right, couple miscellaneous items. Continuous integration, making sure that your code passes a build before you actually deploy it. Frequent releases frequent releases, kind of self-explanatory. Uh, refactoring, not as a thing that you do once, but as a thing that you do constantly, always looking to improve the health of your code base. Uh, conventional APIs, uh, basically using things like Rails REST or, um, or, uh, or JSON API, uh, or just you know, the normal ways of, of, uh, of doing stuff in the language of, of choice, you know, things like adder reader and adder writer, rather than you know, get adder and get you know, set adder. Uh, in Ruby, or the opposite, I guess, in Java. Um, just, you know, kind of using the things that people expect. Uh, so those fall out kind of all over. CI is mainly an accuracy thing. You want to know that your code works. Refactoring uh, is on that border between accuracy and sustainability uh, because it helps you write code correctly because usually you're refactoring in the context of, of writing new code. It helps you make sure that you got it right. It also helps you uh, keep your code base healthy in the long run. Um, conventional APIs uh, I put on up top because I think that they are usually well designed and they leave you room to grow in the future. Um, and frequent releases. So um, I, I, I did not think of frequent releases as a, as a central practice for a long time, so it's kind of a recent revelation for me. Um, but the truth is, when you release things frequently, 
first of all, you figure out that things are broken really fast. Uh, so that, I guess, helps your accuracy. Um, it helps your sustainability because you're not building castles on top of foundations, which you only later find out when you deploy are actually broken. And it helps out with usefulness because until you've actually shipped, any changes that you've made, you could think of as inventory, right? You haven't actually created value until you've shipped. And the faster that you ship, even a small bit of functionality, the, the faster it's gonna create value. Okay, so we've, cover, co we've covered a lot of ground. We have a pretty diverse strategy, but we're kind of missing something. What goes in that red area? What, what's going in that usefulness section that we can use to balance out this picture of software quality? To me, it's practices that, that are centered on user-oriented thinking. The main one, which kind of leads to all the others, is a focus on delivering value. Rather than thinking about like, what's you know, a cool thing that we could do now, uh, or, or thinking about it from a very technical, like okay, let's build it up you know, from the ground up, just focus on what's the next thing that I can do that will create value for, for our users. To understand that better, you have to actually talk to your users. You have to research their needs. You have to, you have to uh, if you can, collaborate with them. Uh, the closer collaboration you can do, the better you'll be able to actually solve their problems because you'll understand what their problems are. Prioritization. Uh, it's really easy to get caught up in like, what's, what's a cool thing to build, but if you're focused on delivering value, you'll prioritize the, the actual most important things for delivering value. Discoverability. Uh, if you create a really cool feature, but nobody can find it, then you might as well have not done any of that coding, because it's useless. Uh, empathetic UI was not a term until about three seconds ago, uh, as far as I know. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's a real term, but what I mean is a UI that thinks about what are the needs of my users, what kind of situations are they gonna be in when they're using uh, our software, and then how do we anticipate those needs and give them what they need in the way that they need it. On time depends on your, uh, your organization and on your users and their needs, um, but if you're writing tax software, really try not to be a year late. Uh, performance. We always think of performance as a computer science thing, and, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Uh, part, I mean, part of it is because, yes, like, so much of computer science curricula is about performance, but, but it, that, it's, it doesn't matter for some reason of technical accuracy or anything. It matters because users can't wait forever for, uh, uh, you know, for, for your, uh, your app to, to work. It, it's just to meet a user need, and when you do performance optimization, you have to actually focus on meeting that user need uh, and what are the things that they actually need me to optimize. So that's pretty good in the red area. I'm just gonna add a couple more things for technical products. Documentation is the face of your product to your users. If they, uh, if they see a, a distinction between your documentation and what your software actually does, they don't think that your documentation is wrong, they think your software is broken. Something to think about. Writing client code may or may not be relevant uh, in terms of what you're doing, but sometimes if you write a client library, that will help your clients uh, use the code that you're creating, the technical product that you're creating. Um, that will actually be of more value to them than just kind of staying on your own, making a more robust product, but they have to figure out how to integrate it. All right, so that's the whole picture in my mind, and there's more practice that I care about, but you know, we only have limited time. But this, this is my brain right here uh, on a slide. I, there's more to my brain than that, but part of my brain. Um, but ultimately, in the question of is it quality software, I can't tell you. You have to decide. So I'm gonna leave you with this, a blank slate. Uh, I put it, or I, I'm about to put it on my site. I tried to deploy before and it didn't appear, so I'm gonna try again right after. Um, but bring this back to your teams. Think about these issues. Think about the practices that you do and that you care about uh, as individuals and as teams. And whether there's areas that are missing that are a little patchy in terms of, uh, of your software quality. All right, so we're gonna wrap up. A Couple of parting thoughts. Number one is different projects require different balances of factors. Uh, and actually, Kent Beck has his 3X framework he's been talking about recently, um, which points out that even within one project, it'll change over time which of these things matter. Number two, I don't think it's bad to focus on good code first in terms of career development. Uh, why? Because it's more straightforward. Uh, business understanding takes a really long time to develop. It's really important, but it takes a long time. Good code, you can get really, really much better at good code in a scale of, of months, maybe a small number of years. Uh, and once that happens, by the way, it becomes more automatic. Like, you, you'll find yourself, like, less able to write bad code, if that's, if that's a way that I can put it. Business understanding, you can't automate. It's something that you have to constantly refresh, because there are constantly new business realities. So the implication is, start off really focused on good code, 
and then move more into business, business understanding in terms of your focus as you move on. So your career trajectory might look like this. Um, the, that middle line sloping down, you start out focusing a lot on good code, but then it goes down. Um, business understanding is kind of coming in in its place. Those lines might cross. Those lines might cross really far if you're going into management uh, or, or project, uh, product management or stuff like that. They might stay far apart if you're an architect, but those lines should change over time. That's okay, that's expected, that's a good thing. The main thing is the line on top is how much value are you, are you creating. So what can I do to build business understanding? It's basically a matter of learning. It's learning about your users, your industry, the organization of your organization, looking to solve dysfunctions within your organization, ideas of business, ideas of organizations and processes. So that's, there's all that learning, but you also have to become better at empathy skills. Uh, and that's my last point, is that empathy is gonna become ever more important. What can you do to build empathy skills? Number one is read, learn, uh, find out about new ideas. Next slide, we'll talk about that, but the other part is practice, meaning cultivating curiosity about others, especially if they're different from you, which is really hard, um, but you have to listen to them. You have to understand their needs and their feelings and see the humanity ultimately in everyone. That will make you a better person and it'll also make you a much more effective uh, developer and, and person in your business. Uh, so I started a club, um, or I'm starting a club. It's launching officially at the end of RailsConf. Uh, we're going to be reading books on, uh, on empathy uh, in the software context, in a general context, and thinking about how they apply in our professional lives. You can check out the site, devempathybook.club, uh, if you're interested. Uh, I'd really like there to be more discussion about these things in our community, uh, so you know, check it out. But the bottom line is make your software valuable, high quality, creating value for users, and make yourself valuable. Uh, I want to thank uh, a few people. Uh, I'm not going to name them, they're on the slide. Uh, but these, what, what I've said today is not my ideas per se. They're just my analysis uh, and integration of ideas that I've learned from and through these people. Uh, I especially want to call out Gene Westbrook, who was my mentor for my first year at Vitals, and uh, he's in the room today. Um, so thank you for, for being there for me. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say is uh, I spent a lot of time on airplanes to get here, uh, 18 hours in the air, three flights. Uh, so I'm a little like, I have the airline thing still like haunting my dreams. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to say, I know you have a lot of options as to where you can spend your time at RailsConf. Thank you very much for spending it here.